Drink was both a pleasure and a curse in the Victorian era. In moderation or excess, there were many social and cultural factors that influenced the attraction of alcohol. But it was an integral part of the economy and an ever-present feature of life in both the upper and lower classes. Beer and gin was affordable for the working classes and an easier option than fetching water, which was liable to be contaminated with disease. Public houses were everywhere, and intoxication offered a temporary means of escape from the stark realities of everyday life. Drink was closely associated with poverty and was often the focus of attention for philanthropists seeking to address social ills with the morality of abstinence. One such man was John Bartholomew Goff, 1817 to 1886. Goff lived an incredibly eventful life, one that would lead him from England to America and back again, whereupon he authored a revealing first-hand account of the desperate lives of people he met in 19th century America, Britain and Canada. Originally from Kent, England, he arrived in New York in 1829 and worked as a bookbinder, but fell in with a moral company and drink. He lost his job and set himself up as a singer and storyteller, touring U.S. East Coast cities. Goff was later reduced to a miserable state when he lost his wife and child, whilst still battling his demons. By chance, he would meet a Quaker, and this set him on a path to temperance and a life of lecturing to audiences on abstinence and moral virtues. In this video, you will hear Goff's account of the evils of drink, following his travels, the people he met and the letters he received. You will discover just how much a part it played in people's lives from all walks of society, and how its influence could drag a man and his family along with him into poverty, jail, or worse still, death. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. In Birmingham, England, one Saturday night, Major Bond, Superintendent of Police, had 35 public houses watched for three hours and on the average each house turned out 25 drunken people, or a total of 875 within three hours. In the London Times is a letter from a very intelligent man who suffered six years imprisonment for crime committed under the influence of drink. I give a few extracts. He says, During the whole of my stay in prison, the question kept rising in my mind, What brings all these men here? Day after day I asked men with whom I came in contact what brought them to prison. I got as an answer the same dull, dismal, damnable old story over and over again. After referring to special cases of young men who had become bankrupt in pocket and health, belonging to respectable families, bank clerks and shopmen, every one of whom traced their ruin to city and West End drinking saloons, he says... Now that I have passed a term of penal servitude as a consequence of similar folly, I seem scarcely able to understand in what the horrible fascination consists which keeps men day after day lolling over a refreshment public house bar. The habit is confined to no class. Mechanics, merchants, professional men, clerks, shopkeepers and labourers are taking that wretched road the convict prisons are crowded with men who, had they been abstainers from strong drink, would have been today the support and comfort of happy families. What their condition is, only those who have experienced the horrors of prison life can understand. What the condition of many of their families is, is too fearful to contemplate. It is useless to shut one's eyes to the fact that, but for the drink curse, the number of criminals would be so small that at least two-thirds of the convict prisons would be empty. The chaplain of the Clerkenwell House of Detention keeps an elaborate note of the cases which come under his notice, and he finds that seven-ninths of the cases which come to his prison come there as a result of drink. The chaplain of a prison for females, 
not himself an abstainer, and he cannot therefore be accused of partiality to his creed, states from his notebook that out of 146 persons brought to the prison in five days, 126 came directly through the influence of drink. People can verify these statements as to the general result of drinking by a fair examination. Let me quote from the ex-convict's letters. I was compelled for six long years to listen to family histories, to stories of crime and poverty, wretchedness and horror. It was with no disposition in favour of total abstinence that I tried to probe the cause of it. I had never been a teetotaler. Had I been so, I should never have been in prison myself. But stern facts which came to my knowledge day by day forced me to the conclusion that a very large proportion of all the crime and all the poverty in the land is the direct offspring of intoxicating drink. Many of them inherited the vice from drunken fathers and mothers. They were taught to sip the drink in their babyhood, and tuck it from the hands of mothers who had stolen the money with which to purchase it. I learned day after day, from the admissions of these criminals themselves, that the poverty, ignorance, and want of proper homes had been, in nine cases out of ten, the consequence of drink. It seems amazing that well-authenticated facts do not move the people. Our own judges are continually testifying to the crime produced by drink. Yet how little do the great bulk of the people feel the pressure of such terrible facts. A committee of the House of Commons of the Dominion of Canada, reported in 1875, states that out of 28,289 commitments to the jails of the provinces of Ontario and Quebec during the three previous years, 21,236 were committed either for drunkenness or for crimes perpetrated under the influence of drink. It is the same everywhere. If hydrophobia, rabies, should produce in this country one hundredth part of the crime, poverty, misery, taxation, and the multiplicity of evils that drink does, there would not be a living dog in the United States in six months. Every lady would give up her pet spaniel, the hunter, his setter, and pointer. Even the very watchdogs would be destroyed, or most carefully guarded against contagion. The revelations of the results of the drinking customs are appalling. Let us take a few well-authenticated facts. We read statistics of pauperism, lunacy, and crime, and think no more of them than of a number of figures that mean nothing. But go where the shot strikes. Listen to the cry of that little girl as the sound rings out from that cellar. Enter, and see that mere child of seven years writhing under the heavy blows inflicted with a large strap by a brutal, half-drunken man, the poor little creature striving to defend herself. The blows fall alike on her head, arms, and shoulders. Will a father beat his child so young in such a brutal manner? Perhaps, but this is a child he has bought from a drunken mother who had sold her for half a crown to that cruel, drunken wretch and who had spent the money the same day in drink. I saw an interesting little girl who had a hip complaint, whose mother had sold her to a villainous tramp for two pairs of stockings. She sold the stockings and got drunk with the proceeds. There is a man now in prison whose wife lost an eye some time since by his violence when drunk, and whose only child is deformed for life as the result of another drunken fit. He is now confined for depriving his wife of her other eye when they were both drunk. She is blind, he is in prison, and the child is a cripple. A woman had two children suffering from fever. One morning she received from some ladies in the neighborhood all that had been prescribed by the doctor, together with money for their wants. The ladies went in in the evening to inquire after the children, and found them alone in the agonies of death, induced by want and neglect. On being searched for, the woman was found drunk in a neighboring tavern. She had spent the money and then sold the articles of clothing, given in charity, for drink. All that could be done for the children was of no avail. It was too late. In the night the ladies left her, 
when she had become somewhat sober, she making all sorts of promises. When they called, the next forenoon, they found the little corpses lying on straitened where their spirits had left them, and the comforts their hands had provided a few hours before had gone to the pawn-shop. The mother was again drunk in the nearest grog-shop. Tell me of exaggeration in our statements. Talk of enthusiasm, fanaticism, and monomania in our protest against this horrible evil and its cause. Look at these facts. Do you wish any more? Endless are the records of drink's doings. You say they are among the lower orders. There is more difficulty in arriving at definite knowledge of cases in the so-called upper classes. For while the poor seem to live very much out of doors, and accordingly what they do is known, the habits of the other classes are so covered by the circumstances of their position that we only see and know what crops out on the surface. But, oh, the revelations that come to me! If I should give you letters that I have received from mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters of education and refinement, ladies belonging to the aristocratic circles, confiding to me the story of ruined homes, broken hearts, tarnished characters, the unnecessary sickness, the maniac's death, revealing scenes perfectly appalling, you would say that my work is a volume of horrors, and yet all stern truth, with no exaggeration. A gentleman was so reduced by drink as to bring his aristocratic wife to one room. No furniture, a heap of rags in one corner, and an old box for a table. When the gentleman whom I had sent visited them, there was a cup of weak tea, and a bit of dry bread on the box, and three orange boxes turned up for seats. There were the wife and six children, the youngest fourteen days old, and that morning the husband and father had stolen the last blanket that they had, and sold it for a shilling. Afterwards, when Charity had helped the family, and provided his poor boy with shoes, he stole them in the night, and got drunk with the proceeds. He considered himself so much the gentleman, that upon his complaining of having nothing to do, when a situation was offered him as a conductor on a street car, he refused, alleging that he never would stoop to a menial occupation. But why try to record cases that are unrecordable and innumerable? I venture to give an extract from over three hundred letters from the victims of this terrible evil. I have selected based on corroboration and where the correspondent is reliable, and I give it as genuine. The author of the foregoing letter was well known to me, a gentleman of New York, relating to a case in Albany. A worthy mechanic, I think a cooper by trade, had an interesting family, a fond wife and three children. For a long time he was industrious, frugal, and domestic in his habits. He was enticed from his usual path of virtue to a grog-shop by his companions, and from that time day by day he frequented that charnel-house of destruction, until he became a habitual drunkard. Night after night he would leave his family and come home late, a perfect sot. His wife expostulated and did everything in her power to reclaim him, but in vain. He soon became lost to all obligations to his family. He was frequently so drunk that he could not reach his home until his poor wife had left her abode and her helpless children in search of him, and by the aid of friends had, night after night, brought him home a drunken sot. One cold winter evening, carousing with his bad associates, he left them and in attempting to reach his room, he missed his way, and to find shelter, he stumbled into an old hovel on Pearl Street, the basement of which was the usual retreat for the stray hogs of the city. In this filthy abode, this poor creature made his bed for the night, not reaching his home, 
Late at night his wife, with a friend, started in pursuit of him. After visiting the dens he usually frequented, they gave up the search in despair. The next morning they continued their search, and, sad to relate, they found the mangled body of this once fond husband and doting father, half eaten up by this herd of swine, with whom he had unconsciously taken shelter from the inclement storm. <laughs>